Our autumn sermon series at Kellenworth Union Church is from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. This is the tenth of eleven sermons we're doing from Labor Day until the first Sunday of Advent, week after next. This story is from Acts chapter 10. God called Peter to meet a man from Caesarea named Cornelius. Cornelius was a centurion in the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God with all his household, he gave alms generously and prayed constantly to God. One day about noon, as Peter was traveling to meet Cornelius, he became hungry, and while lunch was being prepared, he went up to the roof and fell into a trance. Peter saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then Peter heard a voice from heaven saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to Peter again a second time, What God has made clean, Peter, you should not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken back up into heaven. Thanks be to God for God's holy word. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the book of Acts features two towering heroes, Saints Peter and Paul. They each have their discreet roles to play, and they bestride the book of Acts like twin colossi. They are always working towards the same goal, but they sort of stay in their separate lane. They don't like to work together. And one of the reasons Saints Peter and Paul don't like to work together is that at the beginning they disagreed over a Uh, an answer to a key question that will turn out to be revolutionary in subsequent world history. At the beginning, Peter and Paul disagree on the answer to the question, who exactly is Jesus for? Now, Peter thinks that the very Jewish Jesus came only for the Jews. Peter thinks that Christianity is and forever shall remain a smaller subset of the larger category of Judaism. Now, if you're not Jewish, you can convert to Judaism, but ever after, you should keep kosher and honor the Jewish Sabbath. So Peter thinks that Jesus comes only for the Jews, and Paul disagrees radically with this. Paul thinks that Jesus comes for everybody, regardless of your origin or ethnicity. And Paul believed in this message so much that he walked and sailed 10,000 miles across the length and breadth of the Roman Empire, preaching the good news that Jesus is for everybody, not just for the Jews. Now, eventually, Paul wins the argument because Peter changes his mind. And Peter changes his mind because of that trance I read about a moment ago. So that trance turns out to be the reason why everyone in this room is a Christian today. If Peter hadn't experienced that little trance, and if Paul hadn't won that little argument, you and I might still be worshiping trees like our ancestors, the Druids and the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons and the Gauls and the Picts and the Celts. Before the likes of Patrick and Columba won Europe and Britain for Christ in the 5th and 6th centuries, you see, our ancestors, the Anglo-Saxons, practiced a nature religion with sacred trees and groves and wells and streams presided over by a whole battalion of Anglo-Saxon, Norse, Greek, and Roman gods with names like Wotan and Thor. Before Patrick and Columba won Europe and Britain for Christ, our ancestors, our Anglo-Saxon ancestors, their lives would have looked a lot like Wagner's Ring Cycle or Game of Thrones. And to this day, the names of those gods are memorialized in the names of the days of the week. And so, for instance, Wednesday is Wotan's Day. And Thursday, of course, 
is Thor's day. And even long after Columba and Patrick won Europe for Christ on obelisks and funeral urns, you would see carvings of Thor's hammer next to carvings of Jesus' cross. Why take a chance after all? It was just a waking dream, just a little psychotic experience, just an out-of-body moment for St. Peter, and yet it turns out to be epochal for world history and for our own spiritual journeys. Peter's on his way to meet this Roman soldier named Cornelius. He's a Gentile, obviously, but he is a gentleman and a scholar and a God-fearer in every way. This really is a righteous alien. And God calls Peter to meet this righteous alien, and Peter's on his way to meet Cornelius, and it's midday, and Peter's hungry, and lunch is being prepared. He goes up to the roof, and he has this out-of-body experience. He sees this gigantic sheet being lowered down out of heaven to the earth, or maybe better, a sprawling fishing net, which seems to have trapped every extant critter in common experience, kosher and non-kosher alike. A voice from heaven says, go ahead, Peter, it's all for you. And Peter protests, are you crazy? I've never touched a slice of bacon or a lobster roll in my life. And the voice responds, Peter, what God calls clean you must not call profane. (laughs) The message is unmistakable. Peter gets it. He gets God's point. He changes his mind. Paul wins the argument. Jesus is for everyone. And voila, here we are at Kenilworth Union Church with Christ's cross on the altar rather than Thor's hammer. Christine and Katie and I wanted to wrap up this fall sermon series on the book of Acts with three sermons about generosity. Now, Katie's sermon from last week and my stewardship sermon from next week are going to define generosity in a conventional sense. It's sharing what we have with others, right? But this morning, I want to be a little bit more expansive in my definition of generosity. I want to be generous in our definition of generosity. I want to say that we should be generous not just with what we give, but how we think. How we think about our neighbors, other people, especially the different ones. What God calls clean, we must not call profane. Do you think the world could use a little moment of a spirit of spaciousness just now, an attitude of generosity? Does it feel as if our world is shrinking, shriveling, constricted, suffocating, airless, even a little dangerous right now? Sometimes it seems as if we've stopped thinking of each other as fellow Americans and fellow patriots and started thinking of each other as adversaries. We no longer give respect to people that every child of God deserves. It's a colossal failure of perception. We're all fellow travelers along the path of life as we stumble and halt and meander our way to God's kingdom. We're all in this together. Last week, a caller left a voice message at the office of Michigan Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. You ought to be tried for treason, he screamed into the telephone. I hope your family dies in front of you. If you have any children, I pray to God that they will die in your face. Now, this is obviously a profanity. He didn't say you're wrong. He said you're unworthy. He didn't say, you deserve to be voted out of office. He said, you deserve to die. Now, this kind of pinched and parsimonious perspective is on public display almost everywhere in our world, at representatives' town halls, at school board meetings, outside the homes of election officials, on airplanes, 
at the grocery store, in restaurants. It is as if the better angels of our nature have been banished from the land. They have absconded and left us to our own devices. Parents in Tennessee want to remove a book about Ruby Bridges from the school curriculum. How would you like to attend a school where you didn't learn about Ruby Bridges? Social exploration, says David Brooks, is a skill. It requires the ability not merely to tolerate difference, but to greet it with a spirit of generosity, he says. Walking into each room, secure in your own convictions, and yet realizing that they're not the only convictions. Being slow to take offense When somebody says the wrong thing, yes. Quick to forget the transgressions of others and honest in acknowledging the past errors of your own group. Social exploration of the other and the different is a skill. It requires a spirit of generosity. One last thing and then I'll quit. This last story, I'll be honest, is only tangentially related to the main point of my sermon, but it does reveal what I consider to be a a spirit of generosity. It's a story in which some grace and space and humor is injected into an awkward situation. It's a great article in the New York Times about two weeks ago, beginning of November. It was right after the fourth game of this fall's World Series. You remember this? Astros, Braves... The Astros are down three games to one in this seven-game series. Three games to one, an almost insurmountable obstacle in a seven-game series. Almost, but not quite. In the history of the World Series, six teams have managed to recover from a three-to-one deficit and go on to win the World Series, including my heroes, the 1968 Detroit Tigers, Al Kaline, Mickey Lolich, Bill Freehan, Willie Horton, and glory be to God, the 2016 Cubs, Bryant and Rizzo and Lester. Don't you miss those guys? After the fourth game of the 1979 World Series, the Pittsburgh Pirates are down three games to one to the Baltimore Orioles. And the Pirates are headed back to Three Rivers Stadium for game five of the series and possible redemption. And it's a very desperate situation, almost an impossible deficit. And on their way back to Three Rivers, they discover that their manager, Chuck Tanner's mother, has just died unexpectedly. So there they are in this desperate situation. Their beloved manager's mother has just died And the players are in the clubhouse staring blankly into space because what do you say, after all? What do you say in that situation to your beloved manager? And then Coach Tanner walks in and he says, Guys, I know you've heard about what happened to my mom. It's okay. She knew we were in trouble and she went to get help. (laughs) I thought that was just so wonderful. You know, awkward Desperate situation. Generous people put each other at ease. A little space, a little grace, a little humor, because there's nothing good to say in a situation like that. There's nothing right to say. We're all tongue-tied and speechless in the face of each other's grief. But if someone will just give us some room, some grace, some humor. You know, for instance, generous people do not feel compelled to point out your every grammatical error. If you make a a mistake in history and telling a story, they don't feel they have to call attention to it. Generous people make things spacious and expansive, fill the room with grace. So friends, be generous, not just in what you give, but also, also in how you think. Be expansive in your welcome, curious about, not afraid of, the other and the different, indiscriminate in your acceptance, forgiving of error, slow to anger, and humble in your certitudes. Because what God has called clean, we should not call profane. 
In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.